self-esteem is pretty, pretty secure, so we'll be okay. Um, so, well, thank you for coming. Um, and this is a fairly informal presentation. We've got some slides to show. We've got a couple of videos to show that we like. Um, and just talking about how we include diversity, equity, and inclusion in our classrooms in, in the work that we do. We're gonna start with some introductions and then talk about the framework that we have for talking about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the classroom, and then give some examples of some of the things that we do. So um, to start with, let's see if I can just move us down. Here we go. Um, so Patrick, would you like to talk a little bit about the courses that you teach? Sure. Um, so as you can see listed there, um, while I teach a lot of the the basic and some of the techniques classes for the counseling department. I also um, teach the multicultural counseling course. For those of you who are not aware of what that is, that is our um, kind of intro and, sh and not the start or end of a conversation um, about uh, incorporating diversity and uh, equity inside of the counseling practice, um, as well as the uh, GLB issues in counseling as well. So. Um, those are my primary classes. It's also um, multicultural and training uh, individuals to be multiculturally humble in counseling as a big part of my research agenda as well. So. And one thing that you'll notice um, is that normally the GLB goes with a T. Yep. And <laughs> we um, have intentionally separated out the gay, lesbian, bisexual issues in counseling from the trans and non binary issues because oftentimes their specific needs are quite different. Um, where we may be talking about the use of um, affirmative hormone therapy, we may be talking about surgery, we may be talking about uh, families and so forth in certain ways in tra trans and non-binary folks, it's a little bit different than sexual mm -hmm. orientation versus gender identification. So we've separated those out. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, I teach the trans and non-binary mm -hmm. class it is our, our understanding that it is the only one that is being taught um, mm. across the US that we are the first and only ones to teach a specific course just for trans and non-binary folks. In addition, I teach um, advanced theories and supervision. So it's training our counseling psychology doctoral students to be supervisors. So that's different than advanced practicum, which is doing supervision. It's actually teaching people how to be supervisors. And a big emphasis in that class is how to include diversity, equity um, in the work that we do um, in our supervision. So these are the courses that we teach. Um, and it's under this framework that we work to include issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the way that we're gonna be talking about things today is both the content and the process. Um, in counseling and counseling psychology, we talk about both what is actually being said, which is the content, our POTS, and how it's said, and what is um, underneath what we're talking about. So in the way that we train our therapists, our counselors to be therapists and counselors and so forth, um, is very similar to what we do in the classroom. We both, the what of what we tell, how we tell things, the assignments that we have, et cetera, and also how we do it and paying very careful attention to the ways in which our own um, attitudes, beliefs, biases can show up in a classroom. And so it's both the what we do and the how we do it. And we're gonna start today talking first about the what, and then we'll talk a bit more about the process. So as we're talking about the what, um, this is the, some of the content, the what of what we do. Um, and I will do the first couple. And then um, we've actually have some examples of the class activities. So mm -hmm. um, the diversity statements that we all include in our syllabi um, is something that we're very careful to actually read them aloud in class and make sure that they are both um, in writing and also discussed in class to make sure that we are practicing what we preach. Mm -hmm. And one of the pieces that I will always say is 
here is the line of command. If, for example, you are having a difficulty with me and you do not believe that your rights are being respected, that you are being treated in a way that is filled with diversity, um, understanding and equity, here's what you do. Here's who, here's who you go to. And so we're very clear on that first day to say, if you don't feel like you can come and talk to me for any reason, here's the person that you go and talk to. And that would be the chair of the department. And Steve Zenskis is our, is our acting chair right now. And so that's who you would go and talk to. If for any reason you don't believe that you can go and talk to Dr. Zanskis because there has been some issue before, then you would go up to the dean's office and talk to the dean. And here's who to talk to the dean's office. If for some reason you can't talk to somebody in the dean's office because there's been some issues and you don't believe that you will hear, be heard in the way that you need to be, then you go up to the provost office and if not then the president and laying it out. Because if a student is having a difficulty or a problem with us, the chances that they will want to come to us to say, I need to know who to talk to next because this isn't working for me is very unlikely. So saying it first um, is an important piece. And again, doing it on the, the first day. So that's our next point here is the importance of the first day. Anything that we want to have happen in class, it's the same way we talk about, if we want there to be conversation about diversity, we need to have diversity conversations. If we want to have small group discussions, then you need to have a small group discussion on the, on the first day. If you want it to be all lecture, then you need to do only lecture, but it sets the standard. It sets what people are expecting. And so we treat the first day of the class very intentionally um, in order to infuse moments of diversity and equity on the very first day. So making sure that we cover it then. Um, Patrick, if, okay. Notice. I was going to no, go ahead. I'm go sorry. Ahead. No, fill, fill in those two pieces. And then when you're ready for me to move to class activities, just let me know. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, just um, kind of following up with what Dr. Bridges said. Um, the other thing that kind of walking through that process too, for me, because um, I do the same thing um, as far as like laying out the chain of command on how you can approach or deal with problems, even if they include me, is also modeling that behavior and the idea that I may not be perfect as well. And that it's okay to engage with me about if I say something that they find problematic or have concerns with, that I'm not beyond reproach and, you know, that I, I by no means can be a point of stress for them because I want as much over communication as possible. Um, and that kind of flows into with just the modeling that Dr. Bridges mentioned around importance of the first day. Um, for me, that even looks like um, explaining my positionality, both in the world, in the classroom, my experiences um, and where my approach comes from and what I'm focusing on. So they understand what they're getting from me. They're already getting that notion that I'm already talking about myself as a instrument, both in their teaching, as a counselor, as a supervisor and what that means as well. So, yeah. yeah, good. All right, so um, class activities, we're gonna switch. So um, Patrick, if you wanna explain this first part and then I have the first 10, I know these are a little bit hard to read on the next slide. Okay. So do you wanna explain the activity and then we'll go to the next one? Sure, I'm assuming, I don't see it on the slide right now, but I'm assuming this is the privilege activity piece. The yes, sale. privilege okay. for sale. Yeah. It's up here gotcha. at the top. I, sorry that you can't see that. Oh, it's okay. Um, so one of the activities oh, oh, that oh, I- Oh, oh, hold on, oh. I'm so sorry. You can't see, I switched to another PowerPoint. Um, and give me just a minute, folks. I'm so okay. sorry. Um, I'm, oh, there are many more people here than I thought there were. How fun, <laughs> hi everybody. They've been joining. <laughs> oh, that's so fun. Look at everybody, hi. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me share again. And this time I'm just going to share. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's not letting me, I'll just go ahead and share this one and see what happens. There you go. Now is it showing? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Awesome. And any of these, I'll, I'll just go ahead and preface any of these activities or any of my stuff. Um, I know it's probably harder to read on here with the way it is, but if you want any of this information, just let me know. I'm happy to share any of my classroom materials with anybody who would like them. But I'm sure everybody um, in here has, has heard or even probably participated in a privilege walk before, right? 
Um, these are pretty common, especially if, if you went to uh, undergraduate around the time I did in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, and then you uh, would have run into these quite a bit. Um, I moved over to this um, kind of as an alternative activity to that for a couple reasons, just to give you the, the logic behind it. One was there's some concern in the literature and, and um, also in talking to other folks who have used these that sometimes privilege walks rely on the labor and emotional um, sharing of those that are more marginalized to teach those that aren't lessons, um, which can sometimes be problematic depending on the, uh, the setting that you're doing it in. So, um, you'll see my instructions up here, the basic premise of this, and I change up this list kind of depending on uh, the class and the things that I'm watching them kind of be more mindful of versus things that maybe they're showing some blind spots around. But um, I break up the class into groups. Um, each group um, is given a budget. I make sure that those budgets are different. So there may be, you see there's 26 items on the one I'm using this semester. Um, each one of these items, they're going to go through the activity where they are instructed that essentially they are now in a world where none of these things on this list they have, right? They don't have these as right privileges. And they're instructed to identify those as a group and discuss them, the ones that they find the most important, the ones that they're going to buy um, and have. And each one's $100. And so groups will be given budgets everywhere from usually about the highest I give will be uh, you know, 2000, which means that they can pick all of them, but six, um, and usually the lowest group, I'll give about 600 where they can only pick six of the items. Um, and then, uh, we go through that. I have them go, um, talk about why they're picking what they're picking. Um, what's the rationale and the things they're leaving on the table. Um, we, uh, they do this as small group discussions and then they come back as a class and we discuss this as a whole, what were the themes that they see that they pick. So for instance, when I did that this semester, the big theme that kept coming up was safety for the ones that they picked is usually anything that meant that they could be in public, get access to medical care, those kind of things were big on their list. Um, and then after we talk about where those um, values are at, we talk about what are the things that, why did you not pick something? And often it comes down to things that they take for granted. So like, for example, um, one of the items on the list is being able to kind of travel freely without like fear of physical harm or danger or anything like that. One of my uh, male identifying students this semester talked about that that is something that he never thinks about that he never thinks about, um, you know, leaving a classroom at 8 p.m. and walking to his car and wondering if somebody might say something, you know, to him or things like that. And um, kind of, you know, we have a discussion then about, well, what would that be like and how does that apply then to counseling? Because that's the framework we're coming from. Um, that usually what I do is for the groups that have a lot of money, I then kind of um, and mean and make them, I, I decrease their budget and usually say, okay, now take away five more or six more from that list. What would those be the groups that have more? I have them add more, but that's kind of the major part of the process. These are just 10 of the first 10, just so yeah. that you could see them more clearly. Yeah, and I, I usually try to make these pretty um, uh, ambiguous to fit multiple identities. Some of them are more targeted. Um, this semester, I had a quite quite a few uh, students, um, kind of like what Dr. Bridges was talking about with her teaching the transgender and non-binary issues in, in therapy course. I had a lot of students who have a ton of questions about working with individuals from those backgrounds and communities. So um, I infused a little bit more in there about like um, having access to surgery and medical care that you want, being able to go to restrooms that align with your um, identities and um, and those kind of conversations just to try to encourage them to think about it. So I, I tend to adapt this based on what we're focusing on, like I said, or if there's gaps in knowledge that I'm seeing the students admit to or talk about. So, okay. uh, But usually it starts a lot of conversations and processing that um, don't just go for one day. I will say if you do this assignment, um, at minimum, you want to lay out like an hour to an hour and a half to do this because you want to be able to debrief with them after this, because sometimes um, there'll be some large conversations that come up around, well, why was this even on the list? I don't understand why that would be a problem for anybody. And so you can have some really large um, educational conversations. I'll put them that way. <laughs> okay. 
The next one is a multicultural genogram. And um, for those of you that are not necessarily in the psychotherapy field um, or the counseling or psychotherapy field, a genogram is simply, it's kind of think about it like a family tree. It's a way of using a diagram to demonstrate who is in your family and their relational connections. And this is a specific one that Dr. Murphy does with multicultural mm -hmm. issues. Yeah, so um, I guess to give a, a little bit of, of preface to this, um, there's kind of inside of um, multicultural competency training, or a lot of times we now use the language multicultural humility um, and developing that into students, is there tends to be kind of a big three that the counseling field looks at as far as themes, which is awareness, um, knowledge, and skill. And for me, I tend to fall more into the camp of uh, a, a gentleman that does a lot of work around race-based trauma named Carter. Um, and his big focus tends to be around awareness because that's the thing that you have the most contact with immediately is yourself. And so that's what the purpose of this assignment um, that I do. It's the first assignment that they do in my class actually for points. Um, and it's meant to develop that awareness about self, um, environment, um, and how they see themselves and maybe even how their views have changed over time. And so like Dr. Bridges said, um, some of y'all probably seen geniograms before. This is a very different version of it. I've actually got a, um, a link up there to, it's an older article, but um, I like the way they talk about it, the whole genogram with an attitude. Um, so do some little bit more non-conventional versions of it. But for the purpose of this assignment, I only have them go back three generations. Um, sometimes client or students will go back a little bit further if um, if there's particular po or people in their family that were part of their um, upbringing that were particularly important, like a great, great, you know, um, relative or something like that. Another big thing that I talk about in this too, and this gets into not just the purpose of the assignment, but also being mindful of the variety of backgrounds that our students are coming from. I also do a lot about family of choice in this too, so that if you um, aren't very well connected to your biological family, if you have more of a family, when we say family of choice for those folks that you've integrated into your family that you know may not be blood related or otherwise, friends, um, you know, mentors, things like that, that they can also include those um, individuals in this list. But what I ask them to do is to lay out these relationships um, starting you know, at their generation, so siblings, cousins, things like that, going out to then their um, parents, guardians, adoptive parents, foster parents, et cetera, and then out to their, uh, their grandparents um, if they're able to do that. Um, I do give some wiggle room because some students that they actually tried to list all of these out would give me something that looks like, you know, a, uh, a, uh, <laughs> a Wall Street uh, ticker tape coming off of it because they have extremely large families. Um, but uh, instead of focusing on like you would do in a normal or a typical genogram where you'd focus on relationships, like is somebody divorced, is somebody remarried, where are they at? I asked them to identify all of the identities that they can think of for those folks that they know, right? So sexuality, gender, socioeconomic status, um, immigration status, if that's applicable, all of those things, right? And I, I do put the caveat in there that I do not expect them to call up like their grandparents and ask them, hey, I know you're married to somebody of this gender. Do you happen to be bisexual or pansexual or things like that? I don't, I don't expect them to have an awkward conversation with a, with a, uh, a uh, extended family member, at least not yet. Um, and so as they map those out, I'm asking them throughout that process to think about um, what were the environments, what was the culture essentially that they grew up in, right? It doesn't matter if they agree with that culture now or the values that they were taught or the beliefs, it's just what were the things that influenced you? And part of that process as they're doing that is I also ask them to think about a minimum of three trace memories. And in this instance, what I refer to as trace memories is those initial um, conversations or things that they remember of the first time that they heard some of these identities talked about. Like maybe what was the first time that somebody pointed out to you um, or that you, whether it was a family member or outside that, um, for instance, that you are African-American, right? And that that might mean certain things for you in cultural context, or when did you learn certain family traditions or maybe um, did you hear something, a negative stereotype for the first time about a particular group? 
Um, and because of the fact that I'm asking them to share a lot of personal information in this, I will say that I kind of set the tone too by saying that even if I have a GA or teaching aides and things like that that help me with this course, they don't look at this information. This information only goes to me. Um, and I let them get creative with the genogram. Uh, some folks are gonna give me um, you know, go into Word and just give me boxes and circles, and that's fine. I also have people that have legitimately printed off pictures of their family members and put them on poster boards and written underneath them and, and glitter and things like that. I think about all my, my wonderful school counselors that tend to be my creative folks that uh, will give me a lot. Um, and then uh, once they've done all of that, they then write a reflective paper. And in that, I ask them to think about what were the trace memories they heard? How did they influence them? How do they think their positionality and their families and those things that they heard about growing up impact them now? And um, again, because my focus is, tends to be more on developing counselors and what that's gonna look like when they enter into these cross-cultural counseling relationships, I then ask them to take the next step, which is, what does that mean for you in the room with someone, right? Who are you as a person walking in to have these conversations? What is that going to mean, right? Are there assumptions that you, your clients might make about you because of privileged identities you might hold or oppressed identities that you may hold? And, um, and then what does that look like when you have this mixed bag of identities that most of us do? Yeah, so. This is the is the rest of this yeah. right and the rest of the assignment yeah that's just the kind of the it's not that they have to do it but it gives them some examples or things to think about in terms of the trace memories and how they should uh, look at it so while i use this for counseling if you were having if you were doing this in a non-counseling class and just wanting somebody to think more about themselves you could very easily modify this to just think more about um how does this have you interpret your worldview, right? How does this um, do it? I think about, for those of you who are teaching people to be future educators, how might this impact um, how your students see you, how you're gonna work with your, um, your students after the fact? Yeah. Great. I've also included here, um, this is sort of the diversity wheel. wheel. Um, we use this a lot to start as a way of beginning to talk about uh, our own identities and how they may impact the work we're doing. It also helps us with our conceptualization of our clients and what might be going on with them. So it's something that we talk about in all of our classes. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm just gonna go ahead and also show this one very quickly. This is um, another way of talking about identity. Um, the identities you think about most often, least often, what identities would you like to learn more about? identities that have the strongest effect on how you perceive yourself, and again, identities that have the greatest effect on how others perceive you. And one of the ways that we use this is to, when I'm teaching supervision, is for the people that are supervisors to talk with their supervisees about how their own identities might impact the work that they're doing and might impact the work with their clients. And sometimes this is the very first time that there are that the supervisees are seeing practicum are seeing clients. They're in their very first practicum. And so there's a lot to consider about trying to be the best therapist or the best counselor they can be, while also recognizing their own identities and how their own identities might be impacting uh, the people they're working with, their clients. I think what's tricky for a lot of people is that when they're brand new, they're just trying to get comfortable sitting with somebody in a space for 50 minutes or half an hour, because that seems completely undoable, but never allowing them to forget that their identities have a role that is playing between themselves and their clients. And so making sure that it is in the forefront of our the work that we do and the intention that we set and the way that we conceptualize all the time. And so continuing to bring this up. Um, again, thinking about time for just a minute, I'm gonna go back and let's see if it continues to let me share here. If I go back, nope. All right, so we're gonna stop share and we're gonna go back again. So sorry, folks. I had it all fancy schmancied out where it was supposed to, huh. Well, now it's showing it twice. Let's see what happens when I share now. Are we back on the main one? We are. Okay, good. Um, yeah, it was 
you can't go horizontal and then vertical. So <laughs> I had it all, it works really well in, in theory. Um, the next piece on here is our, our readings that we do. And one of the things I think that we're very conscious of is there are standard readings in the field of uh, counseling and psychotherapy, and they tend to be white men. If we're talking especially about our theoretical orientations, if you're talking Freud, uh, Rogers, Fritz Perls, um, and yes, they are the standards, but it doesn't mean that that's all that is out there. So being very intentional, including voices that did not have the microphone in that time period to make sure that we are fully representing the theories and ideas and including newer voices in the readings that we do. Um, you know, it, it, and this takes yearly updating. Um, we may have readings that we like and that serve a good purpose and we need to keep looking for more because I believe that um, infusion of diversity in every class, this is our red square, just hopping over just a few mm -hmm. here. Um, it means from the examples that we give, the conceptualization uh, assignments that we do, the way that we talk about identity and diversity in everything that we do, it, rather than having it be a one-off course. So um, in the past, it was, you would, have all of your lectures and then one week would be the multiculturalism week or one week would be the week that we talk about uh, gender identity and one week we're talking about race and instead um, you know Patrick and I were talking about this that truly infusion of diversity in every single course class period um, is vital to show that it's not just something we think about occasionally but we have to think about it consistently. It has to be in the air that we breathe and doing so means that we need to bring it up consistently and not be afraid of talking about it. Um, we have a couple of videos that we would like to show. Um, and if we move to those next, I think it shows the intention of not avoiding. One of the things about talking about race, diversity, and equity is feeling as comfortable as we can being uncomfortable and, and talking about it. And that brings us to Lovey. And let's see if this, please let me know if you have trouble hearing. I'm a professional troublemaker. As my job is to critique the world, the shoddy systems, and the people who refuse to do better. As a writer, as a speaker, as a shady Nigerian, I feel like my purpose is to be this cat. <laughs> I am the person who's looking at other people like, I need you to fix it. That is me. I want us to leave this world better than we found it. And how I choose to affect change is by speaking up, by being the first and by being the domino. For a line of dominoes to fall, one has to fall first, which then leaves the other choiceless to do the same. And that domino that falls, we're hoping that, OK, the next person that sees this is inspired to be a domino. Being the domino for me, looks like speaking up and doing the things that are really difficult, especially when they're needed, with the hope that others will follow suit. And here's the thing. I'm the person who says what you might be thinking, but dare not to say. And a lot of times, people think that we're fearless, the people who do this, we're fearless. We're not fearless. We're not unafraid of the consequences or the sacrifices that we have to make by speaking truth to power. What happens is we feel like we have to, because there are too few people in the world willing to be the domino, too few people willing to take that fall. We're not doing it without fear. Now, let's talk about fear. I knew exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up. I was like, I'm going to be a doctor. Dr. Lovey was the dream. I was Doc McStuffins before it was a thing. <laughs> and 
And I remember when I went to college, my freshman year, I had to take Chemistry 101 for my pre-med major. I got the first and last D of my academic career. <laughs> so I went to my advisor and I was like, OK, let's drop the pre-med, because this doctor thing is not going to work, because I don't even like hospitals. So <laughs> let's just consider that done for. And that same semester, I started blogging. That was 2003. So as that one dream was ending, another was beginning. And then what was a cute hobby became my full-time job when I lost my marketing job in 2010. But it still took me two more years to say, I'm a writer. Nine years after I started writing, before I said, I'm a writer, because I was afraid of what happens without 401ks, without, how am I going to keep up my shoe habit? That's important to me. <laughs> so it took me that long to own this thing. That was what my purpose was. And then I realized fear has a very concrete power of keeping us from doing and saying the things that are our purpose. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to let fear rule my life. I'm not going to let fear dictate what I do. And then all these awesome things started happening, and dominoes started to fall. So when I realized that, I was like, OK, 2015, I turned 30. It's going to be my year of do it anyway. Anything that scares me, I'm going to actively pursue it. So I'm a Capricorn. I like my feet solidly on the ground. I decided to take my first ever solo vacation, and it was out of the country to the Dominican Republic. So on my birthday, what did I do? I went ziplining through the forest of Punta Cana. And for some odd reason, I had on business casual. Don't ask why. <laughs> And I had an incredible time. Also, I don't like being submerged in water. I like to be, again, on solid ground. So I went to Mexico and swam with dolphins underwater. And then the cool thing that I did also that year that was my mountain was I wrote my book, I'm Judging You the Do Better Manual. And I had to own that whole writing thing now, right? Yes. But. The very anti-me thing that I did that year that scared the crap out of me. I went skydiving. We were about to fall out the plane. I was like, I've done some stupid things in life. This is one of them. <laughs> and then we come falling down to Earth, and I literally lose my breath as I see Earth. And I was like, I just fell out of a perfectly good plane on purpose. <laughs> What is wrong with me? But then I looked down at the beauty, and I was like, this is the best thing I could have done. This is an amazing decision. And I think about the times when I have to speak truth. It feels like I am falling out that plane. It feels like that moment when I'm at the edge of the plane and I'm like, you shouldn't do this. But then I do it anyway, because I realize I have to. Sitting at the edge of that plane and kind of staying on that plane is comfort to me. And I feel like every day that I'm speaking truth against institutions and people who are bigger than me, and and just forces that are more powerful than me, I feel like I'm falling out of that plane. But I realize comfort is overrated, because being quiet is comfortable. Keeping things the way they've been is comfortable. And all comfort has done is maintain the status quo. So we've got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable by speaking these hard truths when they're necessary. And, I... and for me, though, I realize that I have to speak these truths because honesty is so important to me. My integrity is something I hold dear. Justice, I don't think justice should be an option. We should always have justice. Also, I believe in shea butter as a core value. <laughs> and, and I think the world would be better if we were all more moisturized. <laughs> But besides that, with these as my core values, I have to speak the truth. I have no other choice in the matter. But then people like me, the professional troublemakers, should not be the only ones who are committed to being these dominoes who are always falling out the planes or being the first one to take this hit. People are so afraid of these acute consequences, not realizing that there are many times when we walk in rooms and we are some of the most powerful people in those rooms. We might be the second most powerful, third most powerful. And I firmly believe that our job in those times is to disrupt what is happening. And then if we're not the most powerful, if two or more of us band together, it makes us powerful. It's like co-signing the woman in the meeting, you know, the woman who, who can't seem to get her word out, or just making sure that other person who can't make a point is being heard. Our job is to make sure they have room for that. 
everyone's well-being is community business. If we made that a point, we'd understand that for the times when we need help, we wouldn't have to look around so hard. If we made sure we were somebody else's help. And there are times when I feel like I have taken very public tumbles and falls, like a time when I was asked to speak at a conference, and they wanted me to pay my way there. And then I did some research and found out the white man who spoke there got compensated and got their travel paid for. The white women who spoke there got their travel paid for. The black women who spoke there were expected to actually pay to speak there. And I was like, what do I do? And I knew that if I spoke up about this publicly, I could face financial loss. But then I also understood that my silence serves no one. So I, I fearfully spoke up about it publicly, and other women started coming out to talk about I too have faced this type of pay inequality. And it started a conversation about discriminatory pay practices that this conference was participating in. I felt like I was the domino. The time I read a disturbing memoir by a public figure. And wrote a piece about it, and I knew this person was more powerful than me and could impact my career. But I was like, I got to do this. I got to sit at the edge of this plane, maybe for two hours, and I did. And I pressed publish, and I ran away. <laughs> and I came back to a viral post, and people being like, "Oh my God, I'm so glad somebody finally said this." And it started a conversation about mental health and self-care, and I was like, "Okay, all right, this thing that I'm doing, I guess, all right, it's doing something." And then, so many people have been the domino when they talk about how they've been assaulted by powerful men, and it's made millions of women join in and say, "Me too." So, shout out to Tarana Burke for igniting that movement. People and systems count on our silence to keep us exactly where we are. Now. Being the domino sometimes comes down to being exactly who you are. So I've been a shady somebody since I was three. <laughs> this is me on my third birthday. But I've been this girl all my life, and I feel like even that's been the domino because in a world that wants us to walk around as representatives of ourselves, being yourself can be a revolutionary act. And in a world that wants us to whisper, I choose to yell. When it's time to say these hard things, I ask myself three things: one, did you mean it? Two, can you defend it? Three, did you say it with love? If the answer is yes to all three, I say it and let the chips fall. That's important. That checkpoint with myself always tells me, yes, you're supposed to do this. Telling the truth, telling the thoughtful truths, should not be a revolutionary act. Speaking truths to power should not be sacrificial, but they are. But I think if more of us chose to do this for the greater good, we'd be in better spaces than we are right now. Speaking of the greater good, I think we commit ourselves to telling truths to build bridges to common ground, and bridges that aren't based on truth will collapse. So it is our job, it is our obligation, it is our duty to speak truths to power, to be the domino. Not just when it's difficult, especially when it's difficult. Thank you. Okay, so that that video talking about exactly as it says here, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, and many of our conversations in courses and our classes, many of our conversations with our clients are in fact uncomfortable. But the importance of doing it anyway. So this is a one of the videos that we'd like to show to to emphasize the importance of it. I love her speaking. Also, um, as someone who is Caucasian, talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, I need to have other voices, and it's important to have other voices. You know, yes, we get them from TED talks. Yes, we bring speakers into our classes. Um, but to be fully representational and not simply speak from, you know, my Jewish background, which I may know some things, but I don't have what it takes to speak um, as from the place of experience. So that's one piece. Um, I think because of time, we may need to skip over the next one, but we can send the PowerPoint out. Um, it's uh, how I learned to stop worrying and love discussing race. Um, also a really good one, but it takes a little bit. So 
moving on from talking about the content and the importance of talking about it to talking about, um, oh, I wasn't going to start this, the process and how we talk about this. And Patrick, do you want to start here? Talking uh, about sure. the process of talking? Yeah, so I think um, kind of the first bullet point there is is a big one and kind of lead off of the video or and what um, Sarah was saying toward the end there. Um, for me, it's not just about, um, you know, of course, trying to main, bring as many voices into the room, but that also means um, making space for the students to talk about their experiences and how they interact with um, this information. Our, our students are certainly in the classroom to learn, but they also have a lot that they can add to these conversations. Um, and some of the most robust ones that happen in my classroom start with um, a student kind of taking that leap out of the proverbial plane and being willing to, to share something about themselves or just even ask a question to one of their classmates that they don't know. Right, that they don't know what this means and starting off from there. So making sure the students get the space that they need, again, back to that kind of modeling and um, making sure that um, I'm sharing and admitting, I think like I mentioned earlier, and as Sarah said just a little bit ago, that um, I am not the end all be all advocate or you know, body of knowledge on all of this. And how do I help my students tap into those things? How do I give them frameworks to work from um, because I get to do that annoying counselor educator thing and often answer questions with more questions, right, or point them toward things because there is no, there is no one size answer for a lot of the things that they ask. I think that as we look at the how we are in the classroom, um, there's the quote by um, Chaim Genip that talks about we are the environment, we create the weather our moods and our actions can shift what happens in a classroom. And so being very intentional about how we are as we are in a classroom. Um, a couple on here, it, managing the emotional work and labor, not relying on just our students of color to, or of different gender identities to speak from their own personal experience that it's not the emotional work that happens in the classroom is shared by all. Um, as a professor, you know, we say that there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, and in truth, sometimes there are questions that are asked that are not stellar. Um, however, how we respond gives the rest of the students information about how it would be for them to ask a question, if it is truly a question. Um, so finding a way to reframe a question in such a way that uh, allows the rest of the class to continue to have the feeling of safety within the classroom mm -hmm. is an important piece. Um, yeah, Patrick, I didn't know if there was a... Oh, I, was just, I, I would just say, I, yeah, I, I could probably give more examples of that than I, than I can without breaking students' confidentiality, but... Um, I think one of the things that's helpful for early cell, I'll speak for me, and I'm sure Sarah runs in this too, because we know with our students that we're setting them up to go sit in front of other folks that are in very vulnerable spots. Um, one of the tools that we get to use a lot, and I think it can be modified for some of the rest of you on the, the call as well that are on the clinical side of things is just asking them to sit for a moment and think about how would somebody react to them asking them that question directly, right? Like, what, how would somebody else take that? Because sometimes students fire off an idea, a question, it may be coming from a non-malicious space, but they may not be thinking about all of the microaggressions and expectations and assumptions and how laden that is with how they, they're framing it um, versus what they actually want to know. Right. What are they actually trying to get at here and what would be the better way to to ask that so they can get a, a genuine um, question. But that does require um, that requires them to do a lot of personal work as listed there and awareness, as well as it requires me to do that work, too, um, and to not um, try to just sidestep uncomfortable moments in the classroom when a student maybe does kind of put their foot in their you know, proverbial mouth. Um, and the other students are going to look at you to help them, right? You might have those vocal students that are willing to jump on that topic and go, whoa, 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 I'm not okay with this. But 
Um, as Sarah mentioned, they shouldn't, well, from my perspective, they shouldn't be the only ones having that um, reaction, right? We, we need to be there and, and again, model for them what's an appropriate way to manage that so that they're also working for that problem. So they're not getting caught in those unfortunate catch 22s that come up with microaggressions where somebody gets to just go, well, I didn't mean it that way. So, you know, it's not my fault you took it that way, right? So we, we walk them through that process and understanding how they're both being impacted by, you know, the forces of being. So. I think conversations about intentionality you know, Patrick, you know, I didn't mean it that way. And that intent to not be harmful doesn't mean the same thing as intentionally trying to not be harmful. So that's a piece that, that people can miss um, and learning it in the classroom, but creating a space that's safe enough that you could have those hard conversations and know that the work that we are doing is, and the correction that's happening is as help and not criticism. And that's one of the hardest things I think for students to get a handle on that when they're being corrected, they're being helped and not criticized. But if you see all correction as criticism and defensiveness comes up, then it doesn't allow for growth to happen. Um, and so sometimes even having very explicit conversations about that, about the fact that the correction is help um, and to view it and see it in that manner can be helpful in the classroom to sort of loosen up the, the tension that can form when something has happened in that is uh, microaggression or aggression um, in the classroom, for sure. Yeah, sometimes, I, mean, one, sometimes I, I was just gonna say, sometimes unfortunately you will run into students that have an agenda and they're there to let you know what that agenda is and figuring out how you respond to that in such a way that isn't you know just creating further you know, divisiveness and, and, you know, harm in the room and instead just talk through what that means, right? And for, for us, I will say, or at least one of the things that I often go back to is thinking about like the standards that we hold our profession to, right? And saying that, um, you know, I'm not here to force you to believe a certain way, but I do have to hold you to an expectation of how you're going to treat others, right? The responsibility that's being put in your hands. Um, and what that's going to look like and um, and often give them try to work with them sometimes better individually to to kind of figure out where some of that's coming from or where if it is coming from an aggressive place instead of uh, a place of ignorance you know or something like that so um, I've put both of our email addresses here for you to write to us with any questions or if there's any way to, that we could help out um, but we did want to open up some time mm -hmm. for questions and answers, um, or at least conversations. We may not have answers, no promises there. Um, but I will stop sharing now, and so we can see some faces. Hello, faces. And if there is a way that we can uh, be of any assistance to you, does anyone have anything that you'd like to talk through or ask about? Sarah, I've got a question, um, just really because it's something that I'm wrestling with personally, and I just want to hear, you know, would love to hear from you all in terms of how the, um, I know that you all are not, um, at, you know, necessarily subject to that, the quote unquote CRT law um, in terms of preparing teachers, <sighs> yeah. but in the sense that that is something that is um, potentially going to be expanded, um, you know, more broadly, how do you see um, the process of working under that, <laughs> those con legislative constraints? Um, I mean, the first thought that comes to mind for me is just, the it would almost be I, I hate to use the word impossible but we would have to admit that there's a very large conflict between being told that we couldn't talk about subject matters like this and then two very strong pieces for me and one is our ethical code and what that requires us to set up um, clinicians to be able to do um, 
and also, uh, which is also part of the state licensure laws for us too. So that's a whole other piece. Um, and also our accreditation body. If we went to KCREP, right, our accreditation body and said, can't do a multicultural counseling class anymore because we're not allowed to, allowed to talk about the idea that there's a such thing as bias or privilege or things like that, um, they would probably kindly let us know when our uh, accreditation would expire, right? Um, so, I mean, for me, I think I'll just say that I'm doing a lot of advocacy work on like the state side of things and some of the organizations that I'm a part of, like we're trying to set up things with like TCA, Tennessee Counseling Association to go and um, like even hire a lobbyist to go have some of these conversations with us um, that we didn't think we were gonna have to have. Um, but I'm also very clear, I guess, with my students about, I talk about things like, you know, CRT in the classroom. I talk about, you know, queer theory, feminist theory, all of these things, because I use those as modifiers to the, the more, uh, well, I think Sarah called them traditional or our, our uh, foundational counseling theories. I, I mean, I directly challenge those as things that need to be modified through these other theories. So I'm, I'm very upfront, but I think I also tell my students, you've probably heard a lot, or, or at least here more lately, you've probably heard a lot about this, but you may not actually know what it is. So let's talk about that too. What does this actually mean to you? Because um, as much as I would love to say that there's lots of good information coming from a myriad of points, a lot of it is just, I don't like it and people being scared. And I, and I especially think that about our school counselors because we're setting them to go up into those environments where they're gonna run headlong into that. And so they're often the ones here the last couple semesters that are asking those questions more pointedly inside of uh, the classes that I teach. So, so it's getting to us too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Patrick, that's great. I mean, I same thing, but transfer to the American Psychological Association, <laughs> our ethics, our licensing laws, and so forth. So we have we have very similar things, and um, we tend to be uh, troublemakers. And so, and and the part of this is advocacy. Part of this is advocacy, you know, at the state level, at the national level. So, yeah. There's a whole push towards liberation psychology, which is talking about uh, colonization and, um, you know, the impact that we've had on indigenous folks. And so there's, there's a lot that we're continuing to have these conversations, um, but there's also much more being done on a national level. Yeah, I'm, and great I'm, question. Go ahead. I was gonna say, and I'm sure Sarah runs into this too, but I mean, I, I honestly, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with being transparent and saying that I got asked by some other departments on campus to come and give talks when some of these things were originally starting out and have had, you know, conversations with OIE and other powers that be on campus just to talk about like wording, how things are being facilitated, you know, requirements on things. So, um, so there is, there is some mindfulness to have there and I, and I hate to, to feel like I'm like, saying that we have to like trick a system or something like that. But I mean, kind of like Sarah said on us being the troublemakers, we already are telling our students you need to have conversations with people about things that they don't typically talk about with anybody else. So um, if we're not willing to have some of those uncomfortable conversations too, we're not exactly showing them a very great model on how to be, so. But it's hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wish I wish I had the the uh, magic wand answer for that one. But <laughs> How about others? Anything that we can help with? Sarah, this isn't so much of a help, but I'm gonna um, put I'm gonna put a link in the chat that's actually it's for deliberate practice and and again in the counseling um, and psych field you're probably really familiar with the deliberate practice and you may not be as familiar with it in the education or, or these videos may not be quite as relevant but there's a, a set of videos which are literally practice for how to talk about cultural differences with your client. And I think that they could be used, they, they could be translated into thinking about um, with students or with colleagues or, or with other people, but it is that idea of stepping in 
this stepping into the cultural opportunity so that when um, diversity, diversity related issues are raised in a conversation, whether they're explicitly raised or implicitly raised, um, are, you, are you ready to sort of step in um, and, and take that opportunity? So they're really fun. Uh, Chris Berlin in the, in the psych department and I used them in a training last week. Um, and so they're, they're a little scary to do because you have to like, you know, practice saying them out loud, which is the real sense. Like, don't say it inside your head, say it out loud, because inside your head, you say all sorts of wonderful things and you sound really smooth. And then when you say it out loud, you sound, you know, like an idiot, at least, at least I do. <laughs> Thanks. That's, that's great, Sue. Thank you so much. I'm gonna see if I can copy it um, and paste it someplace. That's fantastic, thank you. All right, well, I know that we don't have a ton of time um, left because people have things. Steve, is that you starting to talk? It was starting. I was just You're going to thank you. Yeah, oh. I was just going to thank you, uh, you and Patrick, uh, for sharing how you, how you thought about it, the activities that you use, and the process that you use to incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion in the classroom it was really, really interesting. And, so it's good to hear it from a different perspective, ICL. And uh, Dr. Anderson, Dr. Combs presented in the spring. We'll have leadership present in the fall, but it's a really interesting approach. And uh, actually wish there was uh, more time today to have dialogue about it actually, but I, I really enjoyed the presentation. So personally, I thank you on behalf of the RDI committee and the Dean, I thank you as well. This is going, this is recorded. It'll be put on our, website. And I think this recording is going to, going to the cloud, so it shouldn't be lost. Um, so we can get this one up. And then on March 16th, we have Dr. Erica McRae coming to talk about CEDAR resources um, for us here in the College of Education. Again, thank you very much. I really appreciate the time um, that you put into your presentation and for everybody for participating. It was really good. Thank you so much for coming.